My name is Bradley Backhouse, I'm from a company called Kitchentel. So there's a chronic understaffing uh, in commercial kitchens. And this is so, uh, across the Western world, it's not just occurring inside Australia. So currently inside Australia, there's over 8,000 chef positions unfilled. And that's set to rise to over 50,000 in the next few years. And this isn't a problem just brought on by COVID. This existed pre-COVID and it's just been accelerated by the, the current COVID situation. In the US, it's nearly 10 times that number. So at Kitchentel, uh, KitchenTel is on a mission to solve this chronic understaffing of commercial kitchens. And we're doing that by automating and semi-automating complex commercial kitchen processes. And we've got a patent and, uh, design on a robot called Jason that can completely uh, automate a section inside the co a commercial kitchen. So it can run the grill section inside a commercial, commercial kitchen and it can cook up to 300 steaks or other proteins such as lamb, chicken, fish per hour, fully automated. So um, in the US alone, they're looking at, there's gonna be 12 million, they, they require 12 million workers, hospitality workers in the next 10 years. And this is brought on by the, the rise of uh, platforms like Uber Eats. People are eating out more than ever before, but there's lower numbers uh, of completing apprenticeships and, and coming through the kitchen than, than ever before. So our grill that can cook up to 300 steaks or other, other proteins per service and fully automating the grill section, we've estimated that it can save a kitchen between $1.5 million to $5.2 million over the, the, the life of the machine, so over a 20 year period. We've also got conceptual designs for a multi-cooking station, uh, multi -cooking station robotic that can run multiple stations at once, as well as a robot that can uh, do functions and it can, plate, it can cook and plate two uh, alternate meals simultaneously, so to, to, to completely run a, a function for you know, hundreds of people potentially. So we've gone and we saw market validation from large venues, including Crown, Optus Stadium, ABC Group, who own over 190 pubs inside Australia, and EV2 Group, who are a large uh, hotel uh, chain. We've had our, all our designs vetted by mechanical engineers, and we've got production drawing created, and we're in the process of creating an MVP. So we've got a team including myself, and we've also got an uh, electrical engineer, we've got a financial analyst, we've got a mechanical engineer, we've got Christo Hall, who's a marketing strategist, and we've got someone helping us with commercialization, Mike Avery. So the total market size, if we look at uh, North America, the UK and Australia, there's over two, two million venues, that, and we're looking at 425,000 of these being inside of our uh, ideal client market. And we're making a gross profit on per machine of around twenty to twenty-eight thousand dollars per machine. So our target market includes pubs, large function venues, casinos, sporting clubs, stadiums, hotel chains, uh, and then large individually owned restaurants. You know, pubs, hotels, function centres, and large restaurants, large high volume restaurants. <coughs> So we're an IP company only. We don't actually manufacture the machine. The, ma the machine's manufactured in the local, you know, by local manufacturers in, in the side of the local market. We're looking at a gross profit on the top of the line machine around $28,000. Uh, the cost, the purchase price of the machine is around $86,000. And to put that in context, the cost of hiring a chef for, for one year is around $85,000 with all the on costs. So the purchasers are getting a return on their investment within the first year. There is other kitchen automation robotics out there. So there's, th these are a few we've looked at. So there's Flippy, Dexa, and Rationale is not an automation, but it's a high-end uh, high oven that can do a similar thing to, to us and has a similar price point. So there's the, the, the difference between us and the competition is essentially the automations that exist now, they, they do very simple processes. So there's automations that cook a hamburger or there's an automation that can make a salad and there's an automation that can make a pizza, but they can't work inside a very complex commercial kitchen environment and produce a, uh, a complex menu like our machine can. And the other thing with these, these automations is generally the kitchen needs to be designed around the automation, so you can't just retrofit it into a, a normal kitchen, and they're very dangerous to work alongside. However, our machine can just be, it has the same footprint as a traditional grill, so it can essentially just replace the grill inside a commercial kitchen. So we're currently looking to place our machine inside one, uh, in, inside the kitchen of one of our you know, key clients. So we're looking pr probably crown someone like that and place it with an embedded staff member just to get some more you know, idea of how, how this can uh, replace the, the processes. 
and then move on to um, rolling it out in the North American bucket. All right, guys, so any questions for Brad? Um, how are you working, how do you plan to work with kitchens to help um, be more at ease with giving up the control? So we're looking at initially, we've got a few different things. So in control of what, sorry? So. Um, of food as chefs. Yeah, the, the issue we're looking at a marketing perspective is that um, the chefs don't necessarily want this, you know, they, they don't really want a machine that's going to re replace them in their job. But the way that we're trying to sell it to them is it's not replacing them essentially. The, the kitchens are understaffed and it's replacing the chef that doesn't show up. It's replacing the chef that's not consistent, you know, and, and the consistency of the machine is far greater than, than the consistency of a person. So the way we're trying to sell it to them is that this is not here to replace you. This is the highest end piece of equipment for you to produce the, uh, you know, the best possible product you can for your customers. Have that answered your question? When you're not using the automation because you're saying it replaces the grill, can it then be switched to a mode where the okay. chef could use it um, for like another dish or something? Yeah, we, we've looked at options of that, but there's it's kind of dangerous to be around the robotic arm. So there's light curtains that, that will shut off the robotic arm. So we looked at options where the, there can be a, uh, like an adjacent grill. So the chef can, if they need to you know, do something else there, they can, uh, they can use a, a grill adjacent, adjacent to it. Those five minutes go fast. Don't they? Yeah, they do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was trying to get all that in three minutes and I was just going to go. <laughs> just quick one on the numbers. I think you mentioned, if I feel correct, you said it was saves or makes 1.5 million over 20, 20 years. Yep. The, uh, what assumptions did you make to come up with those numbers? So we worked out the cost of the chefs that we could replace essentially. So if, you, if you're looking at a venue where they're just doing, say, one service per day, it's going to be on the lower end. But if they're doing two services or more per day, it can, uh, um, you know, obviously save them more money. So we, 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 the, the, I guess the, the whole promise of the, of the company is that we're not about building equipment. We're here to solve that problem of, and we're here to, we're here to um, you know, cut the labour down and, 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 and replace the chef in the kitchen, essentially. Um, who, who manufactures the actual equipment? Uh, so there's ABB Robotics is doing the actual arm. Yeah. There's nothing new. So there's no, there's nothing new essentially. We're just putting things. We, we haven't invented any new technology. We're just putting things in a different kind of a different way. There's there's because uh, it's a basically a water chamber that, that keeps it, them to a precise temperature. So we designed the the water chambers and we're just getting them produced by local manufacturers. But yeah, there's nothing there's nothing new in there. To, it's basically just grill, a, a, a traditional grill and a traditional frame with, with a robotic attached to it, essentially. Yep. Okay, what's your approximate cost on the uh, prototype with your, with your manufacturer? The, the, the prototype or the yes, production level? The working prototype. Yeah. The working prototype, we were looking probably 150000 I was just going to say, what led you to do this? I know there's a kitchen staff shortage, but you personally, what made you? Uh, so I'm a chef, yep. and um, I've just been tired of being let down in the kitchen for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Get a I was a chef, I haven't been a chef for a while. Yeah. Uh, what was the ask of your pitch? So the ask, I'm looking to raise 1.2 million in capital. <clears throat> um. You said you're an IP company, essentially, and you're yep. going to get other manufacturers to, to make it. Yep. So who's your actual customer? Is it the restaurants or is it manufacturers? No, it's the restaurants. We're going to sell direct to the restaurants. Okay. Yep. And then you're going to find a manufacturing partner in the area to manufacture it for Correct, you. Correct, yeah. Right. We may at some stage look to manufacture it ourselves, but, you know, it's like... So it's a lot of overhead to do that, so... Okay. And you're paying the manufacturer to do it for it's, you? Yeah, They're correct. not buying the IP off you to... No. Got you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what, like, if you're in the middle of a shift and it stops working, is it your responsibility, your company, is it the manufacturer's responsibility to come out and fix it? So it we're shift? looking to get service agreements in place, but everything's modular. So basically it is a, uh, it's hard to explain without seeing it, but it's a set of um, drawers that can click in and click out. And we're, we're looking at the option of having a, a um, replacement drawer available so that they can just click in and click it out and then that drawer can be be sent off and to be replaced um 
I mean, but you know, if it if it has a complete uh, meltdown breakdown, you know, that, that's an issue. But that happens in kitchens if the oven breaks down, or if, you know, it, it's just something that happens from time to time and can't be avoided, unfortunately. Awesome. Okay. Well, well, good on you. Bro. Hopefully that was useful and you got some good feedback and yeah, we should want to incorporate in your next, next time round. Okay. Sure. Why not? Fine. What <clears throat> All right. Next we have Jean S. Is that on the website? Cool. Morning, I'm Svetlana. I have a question for you. Who has ever taken medication? And please keep your hands up if you had a medication that didn't work or had side effects. Yeah, quite a few of us. So you would be pleased to hear that you are not alone. As more than 70% of initially prescribed medications are ineffective or cause uh, side effects, sometimes even very serious. And the reason for that is in our genes. So more than 98% of us carry at least one genetic variation that would determine how we respond to, to the therapy. So each time doctor prescribes new medication, you don't actually know where you are going to end up on this wheel of response. So um, if we just avoid these drug adverse effects, it would save uh, more than $1 billion uh, Australian health system alone. And in US that projects to more than $100 million yearly, every single year. So uh, for example, if you look at a patient um, who is depressed and goes to see a doctor, doctor doesn't know what is the correct uh, medication uh, to, to prescribe. And sometimes it can take a couple of years to find the optimal uh, therapy for patients. By using our solution, genetic test, we can, um, and, and the software solution to, to report on prescriptome, which is all the genes that, um, that are shown to have uh, gene drug associations, doctor can prescribe the right dose right drug at the right dose every time. There are some service providers currently, but uh, we are going to um, manufacture a medical device that can be utilized by pathology labs in Australia and overseas. We will have results in two to three days, and due to our technology, we will be able to uh, include more genetic variation in all ethnic groups and for both blood and oral fluids. Our kit is going to be TGA approved and CE marked so that it is appropriate for use in pathology labs in Australia and overseas. We have performed uh, market validation and we are in negotiation with a major customer. And as early adopters, we identified uh, psychiatrists and pain uh, management specialists uh, they are going to champion our products uh, so that uh, pathology labs are utilizing it. And animal health is also a big market for us. Uh, as revenue streams, they are, we are going to be selling the kit. We will be able to uh, license the software and also potentially to provide a service. We finalized the concept phase and are now in development phase testing our prototype. Uh, with uh, on the track to, to release the product to the market in Q3 2022. So if you don't want to be a lab rat when you uh, try a new medication, GNS can help you provide personalized precision medicine for best health, health outcomes. All right, who's got questions? Is it um, one test per drug, or do you get one test and then the doctor knows all the different 
drugs that will work for you, won't work for you? Yeah, so we, we discussed that with doctors. It is not going to be one test, one drug. So we will have a, um, a panel of tests. So that's what we had like, there's going to be a mind test or cardiovascular. So not everything, because doctors don't have time to go through everything and they, they, they wouldn't use it if we put everything together, it's just overwhelming. Yeah. So it is going to be targeted for, for a disease type. How much will the kits cost? It is still to be determined, but we are looking uh, to have that Medicare rebateable, um, and yeah, it's going to be in line so that it is it will be cost effective. But I can't tell you that. Sorry. Would it be me as the patient who pay for that, or the doctor? Um, currently, there there will be options that patient pays for that. There are some clinics and doctor psychiatry clinics that pay for doctors, uh, for, for patients uh, to do it, but we really think that it should be Medicare rebateable and we are advocating for that. I mean, uh, how confident are you you get the, the right approvals um, and what happens if you don't? We we know we uh, we assess that we know exactly what we need to to do and we are doing all the validation verifications everything uh, that is needed for the regulatory process and we are certain that we are going to get it. Are there any um like legal insurance requirements? I say someone does your test and they do have an adverse effect to a medicine anyway, um, and. Uh, like what are the requirements for you guys and does that pose a challenge? Uh, well, we can't guarantee that because there, there might be, you know, it is always multifactorial and there might be some other um, co um, causes of, you know, drug intolerance like allergy and that's something that you can't predict. Right. So we can just talk about these drug um, um, gene drug associations, but we can't exclude any other possibility of drug adverse yeah. effects. So you'll be upfront so, about what you can detect? Yes, and, absolutely. Yeah. If there cool. will be a clear disclaimer. Cool. Um, I think you might just answer the question, but how does it deal with drug interactions? So you'll specify mind and pain. Mm -hmm. And I've been in a situation where I'm okay with the, the antidepressants, and I'm okay with painkillers, but the two combined for me are a real problem. Um, well, you need two tests or... Sorry, I didn't hear. What, what is the real problem? The interaction between... Ah, uh, yes. Drugs. So we really, just for that reason, we really don't think that patients should come and, and get these tests. So it should be mediated by doctors and doctors should be the ones getting the... Uh, the results so that they can really judge based on the, uh, the whole clinical picture of the patient and all the drugs and interactions uh, because it's quite co complex so doctors would have to assess and then prescribe the right therapy. So one thing I didn't quite understand is the drug interaction between the thousands and thousands of drugs available on the market uh, and the test will most of all establish whether someone's in or an allergy what, what's your baseline to say if you're in this gene pool, you're going to have a bad reaction with this drug or not? So there is ex extensive uh, research in this area and uh, there are some clinical guidelines, guidance. so FDA, some European regulatory agency actually sat down, so there was consortium and they uh, they chose, uh, well, they, they looked at all the body of the evidence and then they said like, okay, for this drug, we definitely know that there is a drug, a gene drug association. And they even, uh, for some of those uh, in Europe and in the US, you have to have genetic tests before they can be even prescribed. So we looked only at those ones that are actually recommended by these consortiums and clinical guidance. So, and we are using, including them in the test. So we will be able to uh, facilitate the research because we will be able to detect more and the labs and doctors can collaborate and get some more evidence uh, and, you know, to do some research. But uh, the report will include only the known and uh, uh, known associations and based on the clinical guidelines. So a real quick follow-up on that. Are you talking to the drug company? 
Uh, not yet. We were discussing about that possibility, uh, and we think that they might be interest, interested in that, but yeah, we were talking to the pathology labs and doctors initially. So following from that question, is there anyone doing this in the US? If the pain point is in the US and in Europe and people are being tested, so, is, there, is there competitors over there, or and that's what? As I said, there is just a service provider, so they provide uh, a service, so you have to send them, so it is like a centralized lab, and you have to send them your sample, and then a couple of weeks later, they send the result. But what we want is actually to make a kit so that we can sell to all pathology labs, so that it is just available um, in your local pathology, you know, wherever your blood is being processed, this can be processed as well. So then it, it becomes more available and easier to use option. So is this a, a one-off test where you would have it done once, once you've established? Correct. For these gene, uh, uh, gene uh, drug associations that are known at that time, however, we will always uh, keep adding new ones as the new research comes, and that's good with our technology because we can add some uh, new findings with these, which is not currently the case with any other technology that is used by other service providers. Um, so for the ones that you've done, that were included in the test when you've done it, yes, that you have to do it only once, but if there are more, then you would have to repeat on this. How fast is to get the results? <clears throat> Two to three days. And we spoke with doctors, and that is actually what they would like. Uh, we, we were looking into maybe faster option, but they said that that wouldn't make any difference. So two to three days is optimal. So you don't have any test kits. You will compare the results of the So my DNA, we don't send it on the local campus. Yeah, so my DNA, um, uh, keep in mind that they are mostly wellness, uh, you know, like holistic DNA uh, things. So they, they have just a small proportion of everything that they do is actually pharmacogene uh, genomics. Um, so it is just a subset of the things that we uh, we provide. So I think that it is slightly different market as well. So. But uh, if you look at every year in Australia, at least 1.7 million new drugs have been prescribed to the, to the patient. So you can say every year that, and, but that's just Australia, but we are not limited to Australian market. Just, and I could be wrong here, but didn't, did 23 and then just come out with something about this in the last <coughs> week or so? I haven't seen that. Okay, there was something it's, just like in the last few days, 23 and me announced that they were going to use their database. Yes, it's possible because you know, when, when they do that, they, they have a certain uh, positions that would be relevant for this, so they can always extract some information about pharmacogenomics. Uh, but again, they are just service provider and it's, <coughs> it's not easily available and they wouldn't probably have all of these uh, uh, drug, uh, gene drug associations included. I, I don't know exactly how much of that state, but uh, what we found, so we are covering the most uh, gene drug associations that anyone else in the market. So, uh can you tell us a little bit more about the software side? Yep. Um, what's your database? Is there any AI involved? Well, so uh, we um, uh, so it's all trade secret. I can't tell you a lot, but when we do the, we are doing sequencing. So the whole technology, we do sequencing, and then our software takes that result, process it. We have a database of these uh, gene drug associations and all the reporting as it, as it is um, um, as it's determined by the cl this clinical guidance. So we have that and then it will pull out of this database and report. 
I can't tell you more about it. <laughs> I am really sorry because it's a trade secret. So that, that's as much as I can say. But also what is um, without test, uh, what well, we are talking about, you know, what we can do. And so uh, current service providers, they have a certain test and then for, for types of changes in DNA, they have to use different tests sometimes to be able to detect everything. And we can detect all of that by using one test alone in just two to three days, a shorter time. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, okay very good. Uh, so we've got um, Anna, I believe, for our last pitch today. <coughs> Crypt books. I'm from Timeframe Systems here with our founder Derek and my colleague Sam and it's great to be able to present to you our newest software development project, CryptBooks, accounting software you can trust. Trust is everything in accounting. Businesses need to know that their accounting, rec <laughs> that their accounting records are correct and they need to be compliant with Australian standards. But this isn't always easy. When you're working with humans, things happen. And sometimes storage methods like databases are not the most secure. So compliance is also a massive burden on businesses, especially in sectors like charities, where getting it wrong could be disastrous. This is why CryptBooks utilizes blockchain. Now, it's more than Bitcoin. What it allows us to do is create secure and immutable ledgers, essentially accounting records that everybody can see, but nobody can change. This solves several problems in modern accounting. Auditing is much easier when there's a centralized source of information that everybody knows is the truth. Fraud, similarly, is much more difficult. And by automating certain aspects of compliance procedures, it reduces overhead substantially especially for small businesses who can't always spare it. And yeah, it's secure, it's transparent, and it's an excellent supplement to modern accounting best practices. CryptoBooks packages this as software as a service, which means that its users are paying for the software for the duration that they're using the license. We're modeling our software off um, quite common accounting softwares. As you'll see, our team has worked on several projects like this before. But we're adding this feature um, specifically for markets that have really high compliance needs. Charities, as I said, <coughs> local governments. And the market is there. Over 14% of it is trust constrained. And we're hoping that CryptBooks really offers value to an underserved niche in Australian accounting markets. We're developing a referral program with accountants and consultants in the industry to make sure that this value is delivered where it's needed most. <clears throat> and as for us, I would like to say, Derek wrote this slide, <laughs> covering my bases here. But we, our team has over 70 years of combined industry experience. Derek, our lead developer, has specific experience in IT for accounting firms, and Ted Tabar, our product architect, has worked on six systems. And yeah, specialized experience in this area, and we have unique insights. After our prototypes developed, we plan on implementing a rigorous testing, pro <laughs> a rigorous testing process in consultation with industry experts so that we can know that this accounting software is delivering what businesses need. And so what we're asking for, it would be great if you could put us in contact with people in your network who you think could help drive this project, um, project forward. We're looking for accountants to, as early adopters, we're looking for people who could help co-author research, and we're looking for advisors who can give industry perspectives. 
We'd also love to hear what you'd like to see and what you think we can do better. And seed funding for our research and development would make the world of difference. Thank you. What size of, of organisation are you looking at? Are you competing with zero or SAC or...? So we're really looking at a niche of the market that zero doesn't necessarily work as well as it could for. Um, our experience is often writing software for small businesses, but we're looking at small and medium businesses mm -hmm. that could benefit from reducing their compliance costs and also working with accountants themselves so they have this software at their disposal at their disposal when they need it. So what, um, where do you see zero not working in the enterprise? So often the compliance processes, for example, charities are frequently audited by government and it is quite a process making sure that not only is their information entered correctly, which is, for example, double entry accounting, it's not changed, it's not, um, we're not missing data. By using blockchain, you're able to create um, records that are persistent and that follow through every step of the process. And so that compliance feature is really what we're looking at. Sorry, one more question. Of course. Um, where I've seen for recently being in full supply and things like that, how do yeah. you tackle that? That's not necessarily the market that we're looking to address. It's more the record keeping and, for example, the burden of double entry accounting um, and being able to have records of what's happening that nobody can change rather than the more human side of um, ensuring that everything is above board. Are those errors that you're talking about mainly due to the key, the chair, no, sorry, sorry again, chair keyboard interface rather than the actual system itself? Because I know for a fact that Zero, for example, has that audit system right through the back of it. Mm. Mm, yeah, <laughs> careful, what, yeah, that's an assumption. The, the, yeah. <laughs> Derek might be better to <laughs> So it's close. The, the, exactly, the problem is with humans. The difficulty that we have as auditors, um, having started life saving them, is that you're trying to track down where that human went wrong. Now the problem is, is that well-meaning, the human goes, oh hang on, I'll just fix the system so you can never tell I got it wrong. The problem is if they then make another error, not knowing where that error is, is actually what we're trying to detect. Um, so if you make an error, you basically cannot erase it. There's no loop of paper. Um, um, I know a little bit about blockchain. Yeah. And nowhere near enough, I'm sure, about accounts. Can you explain how the two would work together in your pitch? Like you were talking to your grandma in terms of how, like, your product, your pitch, how um, do the two combine? So, essentially, we're using blockchain to supplement the role of databases in record keeping with accounting. So this means that when, for example, an accountant posts an entry, it is written to this ledger of inf information where it's going to stay there and nobody's going to be able to change it. Even if, for example, the accountant posted something with a small error, if they go back and fix the error, the history of the error change is stored. If somebody, for example, tries to falsify some records to a dollar here and a dollar there, as sometimes happens with accounting fraud, there is no way that they can raise what they're doing on the system, even if they make changes later to overwrite it. It's a persistent way to store this history. Yep. Um, so obviously like a lot of accountants build their practices around like being partners of software like Zero or QuickBooks. Yep. And, um, obviously as well there's this sort of sense of tech debt um, and not always wanting to change software, particularly when yep. it's so um, deep in processes for you and your clients. So I guess my question is with that in mind, the people you've been talking to and trying to sell to maybe in this early stage, do they get the value enough to change? So we have a couple of pre-existing clients who are charities and in talking to those clients, the they don't always have the wriggle room to spare on human accounting costs. And we're hoping that this software will 
fill a need um, and allow them to both cut costs, cut labour hours, and really target something in a market that is not always tailored. Like, generalised accounting software isn't always tailored to the needs of specific businesses, especially when you have to evade as much legislation as charities. Yep. Sorry, I'm, I'm really trying to find your, your niche market and what you're aiming at here, because simply... Zero or one, quick well, if I just turn on the function that says go to the lab, people can change their entries. Yes. Um, and that seems to fix that problem. Yeah. I think Derek has some stories. Uh, if you talk to an IT person, they'll tell you that all of that is based on the trust of the database that's underneath. But you've got to remember Zero, quick books, MYB, all of those systems, the concepts behind them are 20 years old. Uh, in Zero's case, it's more than 20 years old. And so really there is there's room for another approach. Um, what we're talking about in the niche that we're in small businesses, so not in SAP, not those things. Basically, I think that if you try to, uh, let's say BHP, if you try to blockchain account with BHP, it would just blow up. It's just, you, know, you don't have enough computing power to, to manage all of that. Um, but yeah, we've reached the end of the life of that database idea. The problem with those databases and having worked as an auditor, um, doing that fraud in combination with the IT systems is relatively straightforward. Um, and it's higher fraud and things like that only exists because there's dark spots. Um, one of our um, one of our early people said that, hang on a minute, you're going back to the days of paper ledgers. Um, and in the paper ledger, you could tell what happened. You could tell that that got scratched out. Uh, and so that's basically what, yeah, so it's account coming from circle here. At the moment, we trust the database people to always do the right thing. That's what I hope you How long before you've got the first or MVP. Sorry, I actually didn't hear that. So how long before you've got the MVP and ready for it? Um, we're still in research and we're really in like validation testing the idea. Uh, we do specialise as a company in fairly rapid application development. Uh, Not we, question. Six months, 12 months? What do you guys think? I, I can see a can, can I ask my boss? It depends on what, whether it's worth it and a combination of other. Um, yeah, it's really just depends on our workplace as well. You know, whether um, a lot of the charity work we do is not, that doesn't pay well. Um, so, yeah, it's challenges, but yeah, we're playing that <coughs> Is anyone doing carbon footprint? So, this is always a consideration, and effectively utilizing blockchain is something that's really important to build into systems. Uh, not everything is quite as uh, energy intensive as, for example, Bitcoin. There are more sustainable alternatives. But research and development, it's really going to be a case of picking the best fit and remembering that this is small businesses who are using it, charities who are using it. It's not going to be high traffic um, like it might be in larger corporations. Um, so, but maybe maybe you explain this, but but I missed it. But um, you know, in in blockchain, there's two aspects. First is, like you said, you can't change it. I understand yeah. how it works, yeah. how it could work in in accounting. But also, there is that decentralization. Right? How does that part work? Okay. Derek. <laughs> yeah. So they obviously they and this comes back to government support is that ledger needs to be able to be held uh, de on a decentralized fashion. Um, so unlike Zero, NYB, all of the accounting systems, all of that information is centralized and only um, maintained by a single entity. Um, so we would seek to have that um, decentralization occurring either within the people who are using the software or with government support. So it would be held by local government associations and someone else hold a copy of the ledger as well. Okay. Would my the data of my company will go into the same chain as other companies? Uh, potentially, yes. Yeah. It, of course, it doesn't mean anything without the data itself. So the, the data that's there, what it does is it's verifying things. Um, so if you think of you know, the bank statement, <coughs> what you're seeing is not necessarily the balances, but you're seeing the um, transaction information to verify that. All right. I think there was one more. Do time for one more question? One more question? Sorry, 
<laughs> that would be fantastic. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Um, our accountants probably got more financial information, um, but it's really just being able to fund that early research and development process. Um, so, what are you looking for right now? Is it customers, um, industry, con industry contacts, um, networking, and feedback and people who would like to put in what they would like to see from the system. And yeah, seed funding is great. But... <laughs> All right. Cool. Thank you very much. All righty. So that's the end of our three official pitches. Um, so who would like to get up and do a, an ad hoc pitch, a walk-in? So you're going to? Yeah. Alright. Cool. Thank you. I'll bring up a website. I can do that. Using the internet. Yeah. So your Cool. G'day. Um, Todd from Align. So we fall in the genre of task management and productivity apps, similar to Trello, Jira, Monday. There's a great big long list of them, right? Um, and um, but we are a little bit different. We do things a little bit differently. Um, but I hear you say, why would you want to be in that space? It's a massive space, there's loads of players in there. Uh, I think that's a great thing. It's a good thing for a, for a lot of reasons, but, also, but let's start with just three. One, there is a problem. There's some big players in the, in the market and it's a problem that's been validated. There's other people still looking to solve the problem. Atlassian and Jira have been in the market since 2002. Um, and if you do a search for Atlassian or Jira alternatives, you'll find five and a half million results that come up. So there's a lot of guys still looking to solve that problem. Jira probably hasn't done it right. There's still a problem there. Uh, and three, uh, there's a lot of money there. So Atlassian have just turned over 2.4 billion or something like that last financial year. Uh, ClickUp just raised $400 million uh, so that they could turn into the one tool that fits everything. So uh, what do we do differently? What, so what's the problem? The problem that I haven't, I haven't mentioned what that is. What is the problem? The problem is moving to done. How do we take our task lists, our projects, our uh, strategies, how do we get them off our desk, out of our inbox, and how do we get them done without just passing them over and handing them on to them, putting them in the lap of our future selves or our future project teams? So we think there's a few things that we do, and we do it a little bit differently. We're not looking for everybody, but we think there's a niche of people that will get what we do. So there's four hashtags that we've that we've that we use. So context, comms, culture, move to done. We do things differently with the context. We don't put things into channels. We actually or channels or folders. We actually do it in a tiered structure. So you start with a domain and you put subdomains in below those. Those subdomains can be moved up and down and um, and they can move around. So it, it's not a fixed structure. You can see from a bird's eye view or you can see from down in the dirt, you can see the, the, the actual detail in the in the in the data. Um, comms. Comms is very important and it's contextual. So comms we put into the top of the structure or all the way down into the task. So you're talking about the things you need to talk about, when you need to talk about them and who you, meant to, who you should be talking to them about. It's not lost in a third party app and it's not lost in your emails. Uh, what was the next one? Culture. So culture is very important and I think that both those contexts and those comms actually build that culture. We're trying to build small teams in big organisations that can move things to done. With comms, uh, with comms in both your tasks and all of your all of your different domains, it means that you're there, you're talking to your team, the CEO can talk to the guys at the coalface and get that feedback very quickly, know whether a project has to be tossed out very quickly or whether it's actually he heading in the right direction. One other thing we do is when you move a task to done, we ask three questions. Is this in line with the domain or the project that you're working on? 
Are you enjoying what you're doing? And are we gonna be successful? Gets, this gets put on a sentiment graph that the CEO or a manager can see and actually go back to those people and go, hey, what's going on here? Or, great job. <clears throat> move to done. That's all we wanna do. We wanna move things to done, get them done so that we can move on to the next thing, break things down, reorganize things. So that's what we do at Align. Well, at the moment we're looking for, uh, we're doing an invite only, um, we're inviting people to come along and, and work with us to find out how we are. We've just done a, as you can see, <coughs> version two. Yes, we used TOO, because we didn't want version one to feel bad. Are we good parents, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so we, uh, we, we, we like a little bit of humor and we like having a bit of fun. And that's where, we think the, that's where we think the culture comes from as well. So we're looking for people to come into an invite only. We want to know what you're doing, what's hurting you with whatever you're using now, whether we're a fit. Um, we're a small team of five, um, so that's why we're doing an invite-only thing and not just opening up the doors to everybody. We want to know what we're doing, how can we fix it, can we help you with your problem. I'm Todd from Align. Is that for walking? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Been practicing for a while. <clears throat> hey, hey, going up the back. Yeah, good. Um, what would you say the niche is, or the market niche that your tool would fit in? Yeah, okay, so we're looking for... Uh, we're looking for companies that care about their team and care about their, their customers as well. So there's a bit of uh, psychology that goes around what we're, with what we're doing as well. Um, and we don't want people to get lost. Uh, the CEO works for uh, governments and some big orgs and he sees that there's a lot of wasted time and wasted effort. Um, we're trying to build small uh, teams, like startup teams, that the founder and the guy at the coalface actually know what they're doing. They all know where they're going in the right direction. This actually builds those really great team so we're looking for those guys who are a bit fed up with how things are working like I say there's a there's five and a half million uh, hits for not Jira like alternatives to Jira so those are the kind of people we're looking for they're looking for something that's a little bit different do you uh, sorry to follow up yep. specific Cor yeah. Sorry, corporates. We're, we're, we're looking corporates. for we're looking for corporates, but we but we'll work for startups. We we'll work for single. We we'll, look. We'll, we can do your shopping list, or we can work on big corporates. We're talking with a couple of big corporates. Um, Infosys um, CEO is working for some government corporations as well. So we're talking big teams and small teams. Yes, across the board. Yeah. So seeing like a good fit, but sure. I was wondering how do you actually communicate with SharePoint and you know Microsoft Office is now introducing more and more of these mm -hmm. little things. Yep. So how, how So we we have we actually can you log in you can log in with your MS logins or your OAuth all that kind of thing. We actually if you've logged in with MS we've actually got a calendar that will pull into the system. There's going to be some more integrations going on. Um, we we were Google. We we are AWS um, based and we've been asked if we can move to Azura. We're staying with AWS at the moment. Um, but yeah, we can. all those integrations are there. We like to think that you can get it to your calendar um, as, as easily and quickly as you can. Um, and, and SharePoint and Teams, they've actually got those integrations. You can pull, you can pull a line into your Teams, into one of, your, one of your, your tabs if you need to do that. So all the SharePoint listen, Power Apps, that all would communicate you, you can, you can add. System? You can add um, you can add links to them. So if you've got a task, you can definitely put links. You can put links in your chat. You can do all those kind of things. So yeah, it's, it's about connectivity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what specifically made you go with another service instead of, say, creating an app on a pre-existing uh, task management solution like Trello? Um, because we, because that, because of the way that we do things. Like it's very much being able to see it from from a high level overview, the context of the high level overview, and also at, at, at a task level. So on a task, you can have two guys working on it. On your, on your, uh, at, at your high level, at your enterprise level, you can see everything, you can have everybody on there. Trello doesn't do that, it's very much channeled, same as Slack is channeled. Um, Jira to a certain point, ClickUp does, does allow you to do some chat on different areas, but it's not the multiple channels that the, you know we can have you can have as many different tiers as you like inside that channel so that's what we're trying to do, give you a bit of a high level yeah. um, how does the way that you manage domains and subdomains differ from something like notion which uses a similar thing with agents um, so I haven't actually played with notion I'd have to have a look and see what they do it's it a is nested HTML yeah. link page yeah so uh, and drag and drop 
you can rearrange them all. Yeah. Okay. So it's probably it's probably similar. I'd have to have a look at Notion and see what they actually do. Um, we we actually have chat on it on all the different channels and on tasks. So there's probably a, a, something else we do differently. Um, one of the things we do do is uh, we have Jam Room, which is like a different domain, and we can move tasks. So if you've got you're just getting stuff out of your head, stick it in the Jam Room. And then at some point down the track, when you've discussed it with your team, go, okay, cool, that's a task. Stick it, put it, let's put it, give it a proper home. So I don't know where the notion does that. Um, the feature sounds really different. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we think is most important. Over here. Um, have you had any experience with uh, AconX? They're now linked to Oracle. Do you know what we, we No, I do know Oracle, but I haven't heard of that. I haven't looked at those yeah, guys. Doing a similar thing? This back in the 90s. Too. Yep, yep. <laughs> companies banned it because they didn't like information getting shared. Sure, okay. So um, that's one of the things that we're, that we're looking at. We're actually um, going through the IRAP assessment process at the moment because our CEO works with some fairly high level government things and IRAP is very important for us. So it's about security. So whilst you can see everybody and you can get to lots of different things, if you don't have access to a, to a certain domain or some certain tasks, you can't see that. So we're actually going through those processes to make sure that that's, there is security involved in, and all built into that as well. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm still, I'm still trying to wrap my head around, great pitch by the way for, for a sort of on the spot one. Um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around, like, I know you sort of touched on it, like, I'm gonna like to call it your target market. Because yep. obviously, something like a JIRA yep. is, you know, services someone like Canva, yep. 2,000 people, and Trello, does your shopping list? Yeah, there's obviously software that lives on that scale. I'm just trying to understand how you can try and do both and, and sort of do everything for everyone <coughs> in a software that's sort of either too complicated or too simple for either end. Um, I think that I think that it does go across. It, it's it's we've tried to simplify it. It's about simplifying it, right? Um, the CEO is involved with corporates, and that's why we're looking at corporates. We, we are doing a little bit of, not pivoting, but we're doing some add-ons at the moment. So we've actually built a service catalog into the, into the platform, which that came about because there was a Snow application, there's a ServiceNow uh, company want to put in ServiceNow, um, and the CEO went, Can we can probably do this here. Um, they're still trying to implement ServiceNow. <laughs> So uh, and we and we built the and we built the service catalog within within three months kind of thing. So um, our focus is corporates because that's where the CEO knows. It's pitching to, to startups and smaller smaller companies is about us getting that information back and make sure that we're getting it right. So that's where we're that's what we're looking at. So look, one, the one-off guy. That's why we're doing a, an invitation. I want to sit down and we want to sit down and find out what is your problem, what is your pain point, how can we help, and if we can't, then that's fine. Not, so not the way we're looking for. Does that help? Yeah, cool. Do you have a prototype now? Like, say, uh, yeah, it's running. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you have yeah. videos or anything like that? On how uh, uh, no? Yeah, not not, <laughs> not available, not right now. But okay. um, but it, I mean, it's ready to go. It's V V two's out and running. Um, we're tweaking, but um, we've got some people using it. Right. Um, but like I say, we're looking for looking for looking to invite people in, see what your problem is, and see if we can help you work out a strategy to fix it. Cool. I think it's one of those things where the devil's in the details. You know, like I use Trello for almost everything. Sure. You don't know what I don't know. Um, if I see what you guys do, oh, shit, that's the thing I'm missing. Yeah, that'd be pretty sweet. So, yeah, rather than trying it first, uh, it's a bit yeah, of a well, look, okay, come so somewhere when, early. When we're when we're saying when we're saying we're giving it, we're, we want people on board, we're giving away five free seats. So you can use it. There's no limits. It's it's five free seats. Um, if it need if you need a little bit more than that, then we can probably talk about it as well. But it's about finding out. What are we? What are we not? What are we missing? Because we've been using it for two years. So, yeah. um, that's so like, what is it working? Oh, very good. Cool. cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks. All right. Last shout out. Ready, Wilkins? No one. All right. Fair enough. Well, thank you so much for coming along and asking the questions and getting involved. I thought that was pretty good. Hopefully, that was useful for everyone on the pitch today and getting some feedback and things to incorporate. Cool. Um, don't forget, in two weeks' time, we've got the guys from Tire Connect, so come along and hear their awesome story about getting acquired by car sales eventually. Um, otherwise, we've got this place until 
nine o'clock for another half hour. So please get to know each other. Come and speak to the people that pitched. If you have any more feedback, I'm sure they'd love to hear it. And Jack has a thing. Sorry, one final plug. Uh, West Tech Fest and Frio Star Fest are coming up and the whole festival. So um, if you're into tech and in the space, go check out all the events. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> And they got the best hashtag going. I can't get tickets to Rye, sorry. <laughs> cool. How do we find out where you're going to meet? Sorry, for this, for Morning Startup? Yeah, like I was at the other location. Ah, I, I, I put a, did everyone get the announcement of the, yeah. or obviously yeah. you did, you're here. Did anyone head to Riff? <laughs> Make sure you subscribe to the announcer um, announcements, or organizer announcements and meet up. I emailed everything out, I put it on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, and the next one will be hopefully at Riff. Yeah, so they had water damage, they had waterfalls going down the, the AV system, so hopefully, they got, and they got no lights, so hopefully that's all fixed up pretty soon. Cool. So we should be back at Riff in two weeks' time. Otherwise, um, yeah, thanks for coming. Cheers.